So first of all, hi, Christina. Uh, Christina is one of our co-hosts. Thank you so much. Secondly, Grace, what is up? Thank you also for co-hosting. I'm gonna say this at the beginning before anything else. If you have questions or comments this entire time, please drop them in the chat to Christina and to Grace. Um, they will either answer them themselves because they are incredibly smart or funnel them my way if it's very, very dino specific, but probably funnel them to our special guest Bert, which we'll intro in a second. But first and foremost, I gotta show you what we start every single one of these with. It is not that, there we go, we'll come back to that. Here we go. This is our Dino 101 bingo board of the day. Remember, you need to get five across, that is horizontal, vertical, or diagonal. If you hit five, send a message to Grace or Christina, and you will win the right to ask my mom any question you want about me. Or you can name an animal or an area at the American Museum of Natural History, and I will tell you a quick, fun, cool story or personal anecdote from that space. This is our Dino 101 bingo board. Take a screenshot if you need it. Um, speaking of things very specific to me in my childhood, since my mother sent me this yesterday, I have to share it with you guys. Uh, can anyone identify either of the two people in this picture that are currently in the Zoom room? There are two people in this picture. One of them's me. <laughs> okay, Dustin, you're easy, but I'm trying to find John. Which, who am I? Who am I, Grace? You're the bottom left. Wow, wow, nailed it. Come face, come on. Nailed it. It and looks like I just John, drank a bunch of red Kool-Aid. No, so. I feel like John is... Top third in from the left. John is top center. Oh, damn. Top center. Okay. So this, is, this is me and my best friend, John, growing up. John, uh, you're also here. Let's just go to John's screen for a real quick hot second. John, uh, we have a new daily segment where we check in on what you're building. Just real quick, can you tell us what you and your daughter, Sylvia, are working on today? Okay, today we are going to be putting in the Duroc for the backsplash right here. Okay. Of the, uh, of the tub. Okay, so you have so, built a fish tank between your bathtub and your shower like all great dads have done, and today we're working on that. Yep, that's right. what we're working on. Awesome. And speaking of working on stuff, every single one of you in the Dino Zoom room is going to be working on this today. This is our Dino of the day, the one, the only, Velociraptor Mongolensis. We're going to get back to this in a little bit. Uh, you know it. I love it. This is Velociraptor. Now remember, we now know they were covered in feathers, and also they were much smaller than we may remember from Jurassic Park, for instance. Here it is for scale. Much smaller than you'd imagine, at least from the movies. Uh, shout out to M for making that black outline scale model of me. So remember, when you draw your Velociraptor, you need to put something in there for scale so we know how big it is, uh, as well as maybe name it. I'm excited to see what you guys name your Velociraptors. Uh, all right. Now, that brings up, why do we pick Velociraptor for today? Hmm, I wonder, maybe it has something to do with our actual special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, real life dinosaur paleontologist, Shana Montanari. Woo! Shana, where are you Zooming from? I am Zooming from Phoenix, Arizona. Nice, nice. Okay, I lived in Phoenix for eight months. It's a very interesting place. It certainly is. It's it nice is though, it's beautiful today, so I'm happy. <laughs> So Shana is a journalist and she's an actual IRL doctor of paleontology. She's done field work. We're going to come back and talk about that in a little bit. But Shana, we start every single one of our Dino 101 sessions the exact same way. And that is with, is it a dino or is it not a dino? Dino or not a dino? Are you excited to play, Shana? Yeah, I am, I am excited to play. We've played this before. Um, and I think yeah. you could probably stump me. So I'm not feeling too confident right now, but we'll okay. see. I don't care if you're an actual dinosaur scientist, there are hundreds, thousands of dinos, and so there's no way to know all of them. Right, no, and I definitely don't. <laughs> uh, but we expect you to get 10 out of 10. So here we go. <laughs> I'm gonna give you the name of 10 different animals, some of which are actual real dinosaurs, some of which uh, I've totally made up. Your job is simply to say dino or not a dino. If you need to phone a friend, just look around the Zoom room. People definitely give you thumbs up and thumbs down to help out. I should also mention, Kind of a new development. There is a theme for the dinos and a theme for the not dinos. So as an added bonus, if you want to try to figure that out, or maybe that will actually help you figure some of these out. Boy. So we'll put that out there. <laughs> All right, here we go. 10 animals. All you got to do is get six D minus, just like <laughs> grad school. Number one, Fortodon. Oh, I can spell any of these as well if you want. Number one is Fortodon. Fortodon? Yes. Uh... No. No. 
Fortadon is not a dinosaur. You are correct. You're a one for one. Well done. Fortadon is absolutely not a dinosaur. I made that one up. All right, here we go. Number two. Uh, Atrociraptor. Atrociraptor. Atrociraptor? A-T-R-O-C-I. Atrociraptor. I, I, I mean, no. I'm going to say no. That is actually a real type Who of Who did that? Who named that? I'm going to have to call them. A very <laughs> atrocious person named Atrociraptor. You're one for one. Oh, not, not bad. Not bad. Moving on. Oh, this one's tough to say. Anguturama. Angaturama or Angatorama. Uh, yes. You need a spelling. No, yeah. I say yes. You say yes. You are right. Angaturama yeah. is a type of spinosaur, apparently. I was unaware. So you are now one for one. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. You are two and one. Well done. Well done. Number four, Worthenicus. Worthenicus? Worthy, worthy or Worthenicus? Uh, oh, gosh. Where are you finding all these names if they're real or not? Uh, let's, let's go, look in the Zoom room. Do we have any thumbs up or thumbs down oh, for Worthenicus? We got some. We got mostly thumbs up. Mostly Some thumbs up for Worthenicus? All right, I'll say yes. We're going yes for Worthenicus? I'm sorry, that is wrong. Worthenicus no. is not a dinosaur. I made that Sorry, word. I have to warn you that the Zoom room is not always 100% accurate. Well, how I dare you? I see that. <laughs> okay, you're two for two. Still well on your way to a championship here. Uh, number five, William Soreness. William Soreness. Are you... Are these names that are valid currently or that have ever existed? So the, the actual dinosaur ones are valid and current and real. The ones I've made up are absolutely not. Uh, no. You're correct. Williams, William Soreness is not a dinosaur. You're now three and two. Well done. Moving on. Aqu Aquilops. Aquilops. A-Q-U-I-L-Ops. Aquilops. Everyone, what does everyone think? Does anyone have any idea? I don't see a lot of thumbs today. Nobody Normally, knows. people Some are people pretty opinionated. Up. Christina's Catherine's dog. Down, but Catherine's also never had a waffle, so my complete trust in you is gone. I'm going to say no. You are actually wrong. Aquilops is a very small ceratopsian, recently oh, discovered. <laughs> <Let's> see? <laughs> All right, 50% at this point. Appalachiosaurus. Yes. Appalachiosaurus is a dino. That is an actual dino. It's the only one ever found in Alabama. Yeah. Appalachiosaurus. Four <laughs> and three. You're back. At, you're out of the red at this point. Uh, do you have any idea what the theme for the not dinos is at this point? Uh, I don't remember. What, what were they? Well, can you, read, can you tell me what they were? Sure. So we had Fortodon, which was not a dino. We had Afro, I'm sorry, Atrisoraptor, which is. Angaturama, which is. Worthenicus, which is not. William Soreness, which is not. Aquilops, which is. Appalachiosaurus, which is. Okay. Jenna Hartley more. says she knows what the themes are. So. Is Jenna. it like, oh, wait, is it, is it basketball players? Uh, it might be. Well, let's, let's do a couple more and you can, yeah. you can figure that out. So the next one, Hansbrocephaly. Yes, I Hansbrocephaly. <laughs> Okay, so you, you may have I figured out. It. It's, North, it's North Carolina basketball players. It is North Carolina basketball players. Um, so you, you've already gotten the theme, so you've won regardless. You're yeah. correct on that one. You're five and three. We got two more. Uh, Angola Titan. Angola Titan. Um, yes. Angola Titan is a titanosaur that we found in Angola. That is correct. Last but not least, this will give you a solid seven out of ten Jordanopus. <laughs> no. Jord or Jonotopus, depending. Okay, no, that is absolutely wrong. wrong. Justin, not... I, gotta, I gotta hand it to you. That was really good. Okay, yes, you figured out the theme. All the not dinosaurs are based off of North Carolina basketball players. Yes. <laughs> uh, all the actual dinosaurs simply start with the letter A. Yes. Angola, okay. Titan, Aquilops, Appalachiosaurus, that type of thing. You got seven out of 10, which is great. Um, Grace, tell her what she's won. All right, so Jenna, you have won everyone's Jenna. respect Jenna. and admiration great job um and you got a high five from dustin 
And if you want to join us again in the Zoom room, you can pick the next person to play. But most importantly, Shayna, you have won the right to be the guest bird for the day. I mean, we already knew that. So let's step back for a second. I have lots of questions. And you guys, what we're basically going to be talking about today is field work. Because Shayna's actually gone out in the field, dug up dinosaurs. So you can already, if you, you can start dropping your questions with Grace and with Christina in the chat. Christina is actually a geologist uh, by trade, so she might be able to answer some of these on her own as well. But let's just get into it. So I'm curious, like, when, when did dinos or, like, paleo love start for you, Shana? Because I know some people, like, ever since they were a kid, were all about ancient life. Some people kind of came to the game later on. When did this love affair, for lack of a better phrase, start for you? Um, I actually, you know, I wasn't, like, dino crazy when I was younger. I just really liked... Oh, I had like a rock collection and I liked collecting fossils and seashells. So I was just sort of generally interested in nature and the world. Um, I didn't really start looking for fossils until I was in college at the University of North Carolina, um, where I was a geology major. And I learned that, you know, I started working on actually clam fossils, which, you know, invertebrates are cool. I actually have a trilobite right here on the table um, that I found in New York when I was looking for fossils. Um, so like, you know, I was looking at invertebrate fossils and actually what I specifically was doing with fossils was analyzing the chemical compositions of fossils. And that tells you about the environments that they were from um, and like kind of what they ate and with clams, it's like what the water temperature was. And I just thought that was so cool. And I just wanted to do that with everything. Nice. So. Clams, that's interesting. I've never heard someone like start with clams, and then you've moved on to much larger animals, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you knew in undergrad that you were going to go to grad school for paleontology. What mm -hmm. is that like? What is that process like? Are you applying because you want to work with a specific uh, paleontologist or a specific area or a specific type of dinosaur or a certain area of paleontology? Like, how does that decision process work? And how do you then move from doing kind of general stuff in undergrad into doing an actual PhD? In paleontology. Oh man, yeah. Deciding on where to go to grad school is like a, is a whole, I could go on about that for a long time, but just basically you look for somebody, a, you know, a professor who works somewhere who works on something that you would like to work on. It's not necessarily what the school is. Like when you go to undergrad, you usually pick like, oh, I just like this college because it has all these cool features, which is why I picked UNC. Um, but you know, when you're picking grad school, you want to pick like what you want to study because you're going to be spending a really long time studying it, you know, between four and seven years generally. So you're going to, you know, you want to make sure that it's something you're interested in and that you get along well with who the person who's going to be your advisor, because um, you work really closely with them. And so there's a lot of other things that go into choosing grad school, like, um, you know, where in the world it is. Some people want to go internationally. There's great programs all over the world, um, you know, in Germany and UK and, you know, but the U.S. has a lot of really good paleontology grad programs. You just want to find someone who's interested in what you're interested in. And also you don't have to have already done it all. You know, the, you know, grad, when they pick you for grad school or getting a master's or a PhD, like they understand that you came from undergrad generally. And so you might not have loads of experience, but you just have to show potential and interest and, you know, have a little bit of research experience under your belt just so you know what it's like. But, um, but yeah, it's like a really personal thing. So sometimes you might end up at a at a university that you never thought you'd be at because it's like in a place you never thought you'd live but like the person who works there who you're going to work with is you know your amazing advisor so yeah. I think that's one of the biggest uh differences between choosing a college because you're choosing like a college for a location and a school and a program whereas when it comes to grad school it's usually like who's the person the doctor that I want to work with and exactly. be under. So it's, you're going from picking a school to picking an individual almost yeah exactly so I just, before we keep going, I forgot to share this. I have to share this picture because I want to know all about it. This is one of the most amazing, like, <laughs> dank photos I've ever seen. Where is this? What's the deal? And how, how do I become as cool as you are in this picture? And isn't that the best? It's like the best picture ever. So this is in New Mexico, um, in northwestern New Mexico in 2016. And we were looking for mammal fossils in a Paleocene sediments in New Mexico for this project and there's a bunch of cool Where's Shana, Paleocene about what time period are we talking about? So right after all the dinosaurs went extinct. <laughs> so um, this was like right at the the KPG boundary, the Cretaceous Pale uh, Paleogene boundary. So it's like 64, 63 million years old. Um, and there's a lot of 
Cool paleontologist in this picture, Tom Williamson, Ross Seacord, Nebraska, and Steve Rusati is standing behind me wearing his hat, but he's got his head down. Um, and we had a photographer who was friends with Tom's son. He has two sons who are twins who are actually really good paleontologists. You know, they've been doing it their whole lives. And they had a photography teacher who wanted to come and take some photos. And he was a fine arts photographer. So he took all these pictures of us. Um, that were you know not like journalistic but they were like fine art and they were very cool and he took them on film and like black and white film and large format film and they're like the coolest pictures <laughs> that we have of ourselves probably so this is here this is in north america this is in the united states yeah this is new mexico so if i'm not mistaken you've done a lot if not the majority of your field work in mongolia though is that correct yeah, yeah, I did two field seasons in Mongolia with the AMNH. Um, I know that's a bingo card entry, but you have to say AMNH, it's not me. So wait, wait, hold on. AMNH, there, I said it, American Museum of Natural History. Because that's where I got my PhD. So um, I did work um, with Mark Norell. I don't know if he's been mentioned in any of these talks yet, but he's the chair of paleontology at AMNH, and he was my PhD supervisor. And so we would go to Mongolia in the summer when I was at grad school there, which was really cool, I went two years, I went in 2009 and 2010 and collected um, sediments and things from my PhD dissertation and that I would analyze when I got back to Is Mark. that the Gilder Graduate School or is it something different because it's through him? It is. It's the Richard okay. Gilder Graduate School. I don't know if that, if ever, everybody's I, heard of that. So I'm not liking Christina because she is also a graduate of said school. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's. I was the first class ever, so. Oh, humble brag. <laughs> Amazing. I was the first, I was the second person to ever graduate from that program. So I'm just used to nobody ever having heard of it. <laughs> Everyone in Dino 101 is a big uh, Gilder stan now uh, between yeah. our two programs. I graduated from the MAT program, uh, the sixth cohort. Oh, great. Okay, yeah. So I was the first woman to graduate from the programs um, in 2012. So it was like, I don't even know everybody. And I used to know everybody. And now, you know, it's like years have gone by and there's so many people. Yeah, it's a great program. Um, it's really small for the PhD program. In comparative biology, there's one topic. It's comparative biology, it's called, but we all would specialize in specific things. Um, paleontology, you know, study reptiles, herpetology, genomics like you could do kind of any natural history specialization within that i love all the am and h connections we have here not only have both of you graduated grace is literally currently employed she's even wearing this is the official shirt you have to yeah. wear it employed there right that's it's how this works fun. yeah oh i like that i yeah. wish i had one of those <laughs> oh, Shin, I've, I have i'll couple... send you one as soon as our shop reopens <laughs> i want a shirt yeah those are good no dustin you don't get one uh. Uh, <laughs> All right, so Shane, I have a couple more questions before we go to our Zoom room because apparently they've just been rolling in. Um, I want to share my screen one more time because you were adamant, and rightly so, that Velociraptor should be our dino of the day. It is a Mongolian dinosaur. You have done field work in Mongolia. Why, why do you love Velociraptor? Well, I just think that they're so popular from the Jurassic Park and, you know, but the real story of Velociraptor of like what they were really like is probably you know, even more surprising to people. Cause I think, you know, a lot of the popular images of dinosaurs being big, um, you know, these large animals. And then it's like the cool thing about Velociraptors that it was like really, you know, kind of j graceful, I guess is yeah. the word I was looking for, small and graceful. And they have, um, the, I don't, I mean, you said you already talked about the feathers, but I think that that's surprising is that, you know, people see the Jurassic Park image of Velociraptor and think it's just kind of a lizard, but that they, we know that they had feathers. And um, one of the reasons is because you can actually see on the arm bones where the feathers attached, uh, the knobs of where like the big, the large feathers would attach to. So I think that it's just like so cool, all the things that we found out about it. I'm trying to find, I think I have that exact image that you're talking about, or he, at least here's one of them. Let me try to share this. This is not the Velociraptor one though. While I'm finding that, um, oh, I have it. Oh, I also well, do that. We do have some questions rolling in. Yes, please go ahead. Um, so Martin, again, Martin, you have such good questions. Every day, I'm so impressed. So, um, <clears throat> he wants to know: um, Is there room for people of other fields of science, like say, ecologists, zoologists, in paleontological field work? I was a huge dino nerd as a kid, and even though I'm studying bio, I'd like to know what my chances are. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah, you, cause the thing is there's no, 
like paleontology major anywhere. You know, there's departments where there's a couple paleontologists that work there. So they probably offer more classes in it if you major in whatever department they're in. Because paleontologists often get jobs in a lot of different types of departments. Geology is one, geological sciences, but also earth sciences, um, biology. Like the paleontologists often just work in the biology department. A lot of paleontologists work at medical schools because paleontologists know so much about anatomy and comparative anatomy that they actually end up teaching human anatomy to doctors, like future doctors. So a lot of doctors <laughs> were educated, got their anatomy education from from paleontologists, which is cool. So, you know, all that to say is like, yeah, you can kind of come from almost any background. And also we need people in paleontology who like know about statistics and math and physics because that all, those are all different. Like you could study biomechanics if you know a lot about physics, you could study, um, you know, evolutionary trends. Cause we have all these databases now and data sets that, you know, a lot of paleontologists were anatomists. So they're not necessarily like oh, I know a lot about statistics, but like more and more, a lot of people who are interested in statistics are getting into paleontology. Like there's professors, one person I've worked with is a professor of statistics. Um, and he's, but he's also like a paleontologist because he's the one that analyzes all these databases. So you can, it's, there's almost like, you can almost relate any STEM fields to paleontology probably. Got it. Um, so I, I guess this is about Velociraptor specifically. Charles wants to know, did they have feathers or proto feathers? Hey, Shana, I found the image. So let me share that. I think okay, great. Yeah, pull it up. Here we go. Yeah, so they, they probably had like real feathers. Although, I mean, it's hard to say because we've never found a Velociraptor with any feather imprints. So it's like, that's the only way you could say for sure, but this is a figure from um, Alan Turner, who was who's a professor of paleontology now at Stony Brook, um, but he was a grad student at AMNH in 2007, and he published this paper, and it was really cool because he just looked at existing Velociraptor fossils that had been in the collections and like that you know he had found in Mongolia and stuff, and noticed that if you look at it under a microscope, you can see these uh, regular div little like bumps that are attachments of where these so the d the figure d is a like a living you know turkey so that's what you see in those kinds of birds that we see now so we can see something similar in velociraptor so our best guess is that you know it could have very well could have had similar feathers to what you see in in living birds I mean, it's like proto feathers i mean it's hard because you have to really identify the microstructure to see what type of feather it is because as you as you ask the question there's lots of different types of feathers feathers like we know now didn't just appear um, you know, there was a lot of different iterations along the way. So we're not sure, but it looks yeah, like how do, you, how do you feel about this image? I think that's probably, I think that's probably pretty accurate. Okay. Cool. Um, so those quill knobs you're talking about um, on that we see on those bones, is this like the same kind of thing as those dots you see on uncooked chicken where their feathers were? Yeah, so those are on the, those are on the skin, like the skin, you yeah. mean? Yeah, so those are on the skin. So dinosaurs definitely had that on their skin, but this is actually on the bone, because these feathers are so anchored that they actually, like, have to have a, a small attachment on the bone that connects to the integument, like the skin, that will, like, support the feather, because they're so big. Got it. Um, while we're talking about velociraptors, Denise wants to know, um, did they live in groups? And if so, how big were those groups? Thinking of Jurassic Park and how they were described as being groups. Yeah, the, that's, that's a great question because, you know, it's one of the, again, one of those things that it's hard to say for sure because, you know, how do we know now that birds live in groups because we see them all together? So when something's been dead for 80 million years, it's hard, you know, to know how they behaved together. Um, you know, we find a lot of the fossils in a similar area that was, you know, small area at the time. So it's like, there was a lot of individuals that were probably living in close proximity. So, it, you know, they probably weren't complete loners. And since we know what we know about dinosaurs, we take a lot from what we know about birds today. So, you know, a lot of birds live in groups. And so, I mean, there, it definitely is possible that, that velociraptors did too. Awesome. Um, I have so many questions coming. I have so many questions, <laughs> yeah. uh, And I've been uh, going through the chat trying to answer about grad school and uh, field work as well. And then I got a text from two of my uh, professors at the Richard Gilder Graduate School at 
the American Museum of Natural History who are in the call today. So hi, Julia and Natasha. Hey, guys. <laughs> um, Isaiah wants to know, field work is the best. What is the coolest fossil you have found? Ooh. I just remember the first time that I was doing field work in Mongolia. I was just walking, because a lot of times you just kind of walk around and, you know, prospect and look for these fossils because they're just sitting on the surface. So I was just walking around and I saw it looked just like a tiny white bird egg, small, you know, like this big. And I picked it up and, you know, it looked like it had just died, but it was actually like an, a dinosaur embryo and it had some like little limb bones poking out of it. And it was just like mm. there. And I'm like, what? It, like, this is, <laughs> this is crazy. Like, this is probably around 80 million years old. So that was just so cool. But, you know, the thing is, a lot of the times when you find fossils in the field, you don't know how great they are until years later because we collect so many um it's a whole process to get them back to the lab and like when you actually get to unpack them and look at them like if you go into the am and h collections you'll see fossils that are still wrapped in newspaper from 1910 that have never been opened um because there's just there's just too much to go through and some of them are huge piece slabs of rock that weigh thousands of pounds so it's like takes so much effort to go through that because like fossil preparation is a whole different thing that I don't do that a lot of paleontologists and preparators do that are amazing at. Um, but it just takes so much time because it's like an art form. So there's a lot of times where, you know, I could collect a fossil and then it could have been something awesome and I never find out about it. I was in my supervisor's office maybe last year, the year before, Mark Norell's office, and I saw a plaster jacket, which is how we wrap fossils that we collect sitting on his desk. And it was my handwriting from 2009. It was like 10 years later. And he's like, oh yeah, there's something like cool in there. And I was like, I didn't know. Like, I just collected it because I thought I saw some fossil, you know, somebody said, probably somebody told me like, oh, like, can you just like jacket this? Because um, it looked like it was like a small, I think a, I think it was a lizard or something. And he's like, oh yeah, it's like, I we think it's really cool. And I was like, oh, like that was from 10 years ago and you're just looking at it. So maybe I have found cool fossils that I don't even know about. Um, but it's always fun. I think anytime you find a fossil, like oh, somebody said they want to see the trilobite again. This yeah. is not from Mongolia. This is from upstate New York, um, Devonian. It's like 360 million years old, I think. So, I mean, when I cracked open this rock and I saw this trilobite or trilobut, because it doesn't have its head, it's just the <laughs> end. Um, I was like, that's so cool. Like, I don't know. Anytime you crack a rock open, because these you generally have to split and then like you flip it open. And, it, you know, I've been really wanted to find one because I'd never found a trilobite before. And I was like, that's just so cool. So like, I feel like anytime I find one, it's cool. <laughs> so Shana, you, mentioned, you just mentioned like one of the big misconceptions is like, oh, you find a dinosaur fossil and then you take it out and boom, here it is. Is that like the, the time that it takes? Is that the big, biggest misconception with respect to field work? Or do you think there are other misconceptions people have about like what field work is actually like? Yeah, I think the time is a big one. Um, people just think like I go out and, you know, you go out in the summer and then you come back with your dinosaurs that you study for the year. And, you know, you're generally studying things that were found years ago. Um, you know, there's some people who probably move it along a little faster and get things processed quickly, depending on what they're doing. But, you know, a lot of times you just bring it back and it sits in a room and you hope, you know, it eventually gets cataloged and then it might become interesting. Um, and there's also a lot of stories of people who have found things in the field that looked interesting, like somewhat interesting, and then they realized they were so much more interesting because like maybe, you know, there was only part of like a foot and then they, you know, you collect like a lot around it, which is also why it takes so much time because it's like, you don't want to like cut into it and be like, oh no, like I left half of it behind, you know? So you try to like collect as much as possible and take it home and then you realize, oh, it wasn't just the foot that you saw on top, but it was like the leg and the hip, like was underneath the rock. And so you only see that once you start preparing it. So, you know, you sometimes don't know what you have found, you know, you're like, you just see a little bit of bone and you collect it. And then, I mean, I know that I've heard some stories of other friends too that have thought they were finding just part of it and it was really like a full skeleton. I mean, that's like the best case scenario. Usually it's like, I hope it's a full skeleton and it's not. And then there are times where you don't even have the time uh, to actually extract it from the rock. And I bring this up because the last time I did field work, it was in Rabbit Valley near Fruta, Colorado and one of the women that we were working with unearthed a jacket that they had found like four or five years ago but didn't have time in the field season to extract the whole thing so they covered it with the plaster and left it there and reburied it so it was protected and then forgot about it so she <laughs> rediscovered something that had been discovered five years ago which is bonkers it's like a she found a time capsule of a time capsule 
That's really funny. Yeah. I mean that sometimes you find tools that you left like years ago and someone's like, Oh, that was my screwdriver or something from like 2002. And you're like, Oh, it's here. It's still here. Cause it's like the desert. So it hasn't gone anywhere. Um, but yeah, sometimes like there's place sites in Mongolia where there'd be like a large, like, I don't know, limb bone, part of a limb bone that's kind of shattered. It's probably from a sauropod and they've just like, it just sits there. It's like, Oh yeah. Like that's just that bone. I mean, cause it, you know, it's not necessarily probably wouldn't be useful to study cause it's like not, like kind of blown up as yeah. you said. so you know it's just like oh it just sits there so that's that some of the fossils like just end up sitting in the rock and like that's okay uh remind so you guys got, the velociraptor drawings we're gonna come back to those in a little bit i would yeah. love to see we've got some more questions about velociraptors Ooh. um shana charles and rob combination question about migration and habitats so what habitats did velociraptors thrive in and did raptors migrate to where their prey migrated? Yeah, the, the question about migration, again, is hard to answer. Like all these behavioral questions are hard and paleontologists try to think of creative ways to approach this. Um, one of them is sort of what I did with the geochemistry, which was probably more informative about the environment, which was the second part of the question. But there have been, not myself, but other researchers have looked at the chemical compositions of generally tooth enamel um because that's the best preserved to see if it indicates any sort of migration um, there's evidence that there could be migration of i think it was sauropods in the western u.s so no i don't think anyone has done that for raptors as far as i know um i could be missing something but probably not because it's a really it's really hard because you need like a pretty large sample size and it's just, you know, it's hard to say definitively, but for the environment part, that's sort of what I did for my PhD was like paleo environmental reconstructions. And so I looked at the eggshells of oviraptors, which I know that you guys talked have talked about before. So you can analyze the eggshells chemically also. And so since these dinosaurs all lived together in Mongolia, um, you know, I could get an impression of what the environment was like and that it was probably, you know, pretty dry, it seems. Like a lot of the signal is that it would, they were dry um, environments that were sparsely vegetated. I mean, they, you know, kind of similar to a lot of river delta, maybe like a river delta where there's like isolated sources of water. Um, and those kinds of environments support so much life, you know, in places like Okavango and Africa. So you know, it's quite possible that Mongolia looks something like that too, because there was large sand dunes. I mean, there might not be a place that looks exactly like it used to look, but there was large sand dunes, um, which you also see in some of these, you know, these African river deserty environments. Um, and that's what ended up burying the dinosaurs in the first place. That's why yeah, we, find talk, we talked about the fighting dinosaur fossil with uh, Velociraptor and Protoceratops. Yes, oh, that's a cool shirt. Yeah, the Institute for, Mo uh, for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs, A, is a cool place, but B, has some very cool t-shirts. If you're looking for dino shirts, Institute for the Study of Mongolian Dinosaurs. I had a really interesting question from Martin again. Um, do you, um, Dustin, you may have opinions about this as well. Do you encourage hobbyism when it comes to trying to find fossils? I live somewhere where I could find them, but I wouldn't want to rob paleontologists of useful data. Um, and I know there are a lot of like, Atlas Obscura and other places that have um, hobbyists or novice people, obviously we want to encourage those to explore, but you know, where are the lines between real paleontologists and amateurs? Yeah, I think, I mean, that, I'm glad that someone's asking that because I don't think a lot of people don't think, think of that question. I mean, I would say that most of the places that amateur paleontologists are going to look for fossils is totally fine. Um, it's usually stuff like this trilobite that I have sitting here, you know, like we have a lot of trilobites and there's so many of them that like, if you want to go to a place, I mean, it's just the, the issue is finding land where you can go like legally go look for fossils and take them because you can't go on someone's private land, obviously. And in some, you know, it depends where you are. If, if, I don't know if this person's in the United States, but the U.S. is, you know, a lot of, most land is private land. If you're in the, on the East Coast, if you're on the West Coast, a lot of the land is Bureau of Land Management land, which you're not, um, you can only take fossils out, vertebrate fossils out. I, I'm pretty sure it's only vertebrate fossils. Don't quote me on this. Go look it up if you're going to go on to BLM land, do this. 
Um, but you can't unless you have a permit. So you need to be permitted to take it out. If you're going to find fossils that you want to sell, you have to do that on private land and have permission from the owner or own the land yourself. So, you know, there's, and then there's some, you know, state parks and things that you can, they don't want you to destroy the rocks because then it like looks bad and it's ruined for everybody. So you just have to be really careful about like where you're doing it and making sure you're following the rules because you don't want to, you know, ruin like, because a lot of, because sometimes when people don't know what they're doing, they're just like, you know, putting giant holes in the rocks and like leaving a mess. And so you just have to be, you be careful. But like, I used to live in Virginia and I would go out to the Calvert Cliffs in Maryland, which um, my is like Miocene in age. And so you could find shark teeth there. And that's fine because they're just washed up on the beach. You know, they wash off the cliff and then they get sort of cleaned out by the ocean water, the bay water, Chesapeake Bay. And then, you know, you can just pick them up. So like, that's totally fine, you know, and cause that's on a, on a park where that's allowed, but they specifically don't want people going knocking into the cliffs because it's dangerous because they actually can fall on people. Um, cause they're really soft and, you know, because then it just like, you know, it, can destroy the whole thing. So, I mean, I think, I think it's fine if, if you get into rock hounding, I mean, it's sort of a secretive community. I'm sure some people on here are rock hounds, like you can't generally just go online and type in where to, where can I go for fossils? And it, the exact location comes up because people want to keep their good spots a secret if they're rock hounds, but um, you can join a group and I'll, you know, take you out and show, show you where to go. Like I know in New York, like these, tra like there was a lot, most of the people who were showing us around on this field trip that I was on, we're amateurs and I think amateur paleontologists are amazing because these people spend so much have spent so much time and effort learning about fossils like they know more about the trilobites and brachiopods of upstate New York than I will ever know because they've been doing it for 20 30 40 years and collecting them and like meticulously organizing them so I think it's great and I think you know if you can't be a paleontologist professionally for whatever reason because there's not that many jobs, um, and you might have another job. Um, you can do it in your spare time. You can do it in your spare time, and I think that's it's one of the most accessible sciences that way. There's a lot of talking, but I have a lot of thoughts about about that. I had a question related to that. Um, if there are good resources, this is from Rivers, Zella, and Lauren. Um, if there are good resources for amateurs to volunteer at digs or to categorize fossils for museums, um, so. I said to just look at your local natural history museum or science museum, but is there a more centralized place where opportunities like that might um, be posted? Yeah, I think local museum is the best, the best bet. I mean, that's how a lot of paleontologists got into the field anyway. And so many, if you go to almost any museum in the country, like North Carolina or even the Smithsonian, the people that you see now they have these like glass labs where they prepare fossils as you can walk by a lot of those people are volunteers like they're just doing it for fun um and it, that's pretty high level work so they train for a long time but they just love it so much that they can do that so like they definitely need you because there's so much tedious work to do of course now a lot of museums are i would think every museum is closed right now um but in, in regular times when people are going to museums i definitely just call your local museum um, and ask about volunteer opportunities. Oh, um, Hip Hop MD asks, what are your thoughts on the privatization of fossil discoveries versus sharing them with museums or public science records? Great question. Yeah, that's a really good question. I've written about this a couple of times because um, I have, I mean, I think most paleontologists have thoughts. I think I probably am in like the mainstream paleontological view that Pri pri some a lot of good fo really good fossils get sold on the private market and it just kind of sucks because <laughs> they're like really special unique fossils um that we just don't get access to as scientists if a paleontologist does get access to one of them it's still a problem because then the chain of custody has been broken like we didn't collect it in a scientific way like you didn't take notes because like you know we it's a, it's a scientific endeavor so there's lots of things along the way that you do to make sure you're describing the fossils correctly and collecting rocks around the fossils because if you don't know where you collected a fossil exactly it completely changes your interpretations of it because a lot of it's circular it's like well we only know how old it is because we know how old the rock it was in where it was found the rock is so like if someone hands you a cool fossil 
and says, oh, I found this in this location. Like, can you trust them? You know, if they're selling it to you and if they're saying it's one thing and, you know, so there's been lots of issues with that. And then, and then there's the whole different part of the issue is that, okay, so like if a paleontologist does get a great fossil and it was sold privately, um, or, or it's in a private collection, which is, which is a problem. If it's in someone's private collection, it is not accessible to any other scientist. And a lot, you know, a central tenet of research is that you can re someone can reproduce your work. So if, if people cannot go see the fossil themselves, other paleontologists, um, should you publish, should you publish on it? If it's in a private collection in Germany or, you know, or somewhere else, like, should you publish, if, if the owner gives you access and they say, oh, you can, you can write about it. How do they know if I, if Shana calls and says, oh, well, can I come look at it? And they go, well, no. And they can do that because it's their personal possession. But, you know, is that, is that good ethical science? I mean, I, I wouldn't do it. And I think a lot of paleontologists would, wouldn't do it. So can we step back for one sec? I want to take one more question. I'll let Grace and Christina fight for who, who has this last question. But uh, Shana, what's a trilobite? <laughs> what, did we, you say, what is it? You showed us one. What is a trilobite? Yeah, so a trilobite is an invertebrate that no longer exists. Um, they are extinct, but they were, I mean, they, they actually did a lot of different things. They would swim through the water. They were underwater. They did not walk on land. Um, they would be on the ocean floor. They would be swimming sometimes. They, they're, they're sort of, they're not really related to anything that's alive now, like that you could point to. Um, but yes, they look really, some of them look really intricate and cool. They look sort of like, and they look like bugs, but they're not. All right. Uh, well, I also like, I just want to mention that apparently in the waiting room right now, there's a woman named Carol Baskins. Carol Baskins here. Oh, Carol Baskin is here. Oh, no. Uh, here can we get one more question? One more right. question, then I'm excited to go through our paleo art gallery. And Shana, you can see all these amazing renderings of velociraptors. Can we get one more? Yeah. So speaking of hotly debated topics, um, I know my answer to this. <laughs> but uh, Shana, what is your favorite field station food? Ooh. I, yeah, I, I actually have like some pictures and one of them was of our kitchen. Oh gosh, you know, in Mongolia, like this, I mean, people will probably laugh at this, but if you're from New York, we would go to like Zabar's and I would have to go to Zabar's before we left to like get coffee because like, so we could have Zabar's coffee. It, I think that was a leftover relic of like when there wasn't a ton of food available in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. Now they have like everything. So like, we don't really have to bring as much food, but we would make uh, chili in New Mexico that was really good except I got blamed for putting too many peppers in it but it was not my fault <laughs> but it's a story that will live in infamy but in Mongolia like people cook in amazing stuff we have risotto once I don't even make risotto at home <laughs> like over a fire in a giant wok making risotto it was really good <laughs> Well, there you go. Yeah, I think those like creature comforts from home are so important. I had a professor who was like one of the most rugged geologist people I knew, but we had to stop at Starbucks on our way to whatever field work we were doing. It's it so was fun. essential. It's like, extra fun if you go to Starbucks on the way to Frappuccino. Yeah. All right. You guys fire up your Velociraptor drawings. Uh, Shana, we're going to do a little gallery walk. Feel free to chime in uh, on whatever your thoughts are on these beautiful renderings. I just want to let you know, every day I'm more impressed than the last. So get ready to see some amazing art. We're going to start per usual, I think, with Jada. Jada, what do we got here? Oh, that's really good. We got Dustin and my BFF, Vicky the Velociraptor. I like that. I like that. A lot of feathers. I like that I'm holding a heart. I'm giving it my heart. That's pretty good. All right, what else we got here? Let's go with Megan for a hot second. Ooh, Megan, what, Shane, how do we feel about the orange and green here? That's pretty cool. I mean, we, I think the orange, the only colors we've really been able to detect in feather, like feathers generally is the oranges. I'm not sure about the green. Yasmina probably knows more than I do about this, but um, I think it looks cool. I think it looks good too. M, let's go to M. Oh, I like the blue Velociraptor. M, of all the people not to include something for scale, I can't, I can't believe you right now, but that's okay. Uh, how about Catherine? Wow, look at that. Yeah. Dude. <laughs> you guys are really good at this. That's so cute. Oh, just buckle up. It's going to get even better. Look at this. Aww. 
Vine. That one's pretty good. I like that. Let's keep on moving. Every day, oh, Preventer Raptor every day comes correct. Look at this one. Oh, razor jaws. Yeah, big mouth open, razor jaws with a Z. Every day, Agus has his ads to his paleo art gallery of post-it notes. Can you show us the wall behind oh. you? Oh, look wow. Yeah. Oh, look at that. That's awesome. This is beautiful. Very beautiful. Let's see who else. Eric, every day comes correct. Look at this guy. That's really Jacket good. 1910. That's, that's so good. Mongola Feather. That's a great name. Oh, ah, awesome. Great job. Wow. That's really a good. disarticulated head. Wow. Into that. Yep, yep. How Remember, about we have a whole Instagram account now to submit your drawings to. It is at of the daily dino on Instagram. Send these out. The world can enjoy them. Well, that's cool, Victor. That's As you we're going through. Are there um, ways people can see your work? Um, website, Instagram, anywhere they can check out what you're doing? Peter, okay. sorry, Peter and Tom are yeah. right. Oh, Shana, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'm actually a, sci a science journalist now because I now I write about a lot of things, including dinosaurs and paleontology. That's an amazing drawing, by the way. Wow, great! This is great. Um, so yeah, ShanaMontaneri.com at Dr. Shana on Twitter, Dr. Shana, and I usually post um, things that I write. I write for all different publications, Net Geo, a lot of you know. I'm writing about coronavirus now, honest, honestly, if, which is not paleontology, but is necessary. Uh, Shana, do you care to comment on the scientific accuracy of Velociraptors reading four books at once? We don't know if they could read, but <laughs> why not, you know? Oh, how about these? Phil and oh, Valerie. It looks like a Pokemon. That's cute. Phil and Valerie looks real good. What else we got here? Let's go to Yasmin. Those are great. Look at you wow. guys. These are great. These are really good artists. Right? Another Valerie. Yeah, really good Valerie. The colors are, uh-oh, uh-oh. This one, this one is legit. <laughs> Speedy Gonzapter, where's your That's waddle? Really Good question. Where is the waddle? Uh oh, this one. I love this. I absolutely <laughs> love this one. That is great. Well done, sir. Nice. Uh, Adela's got one here. Bob and Larry. Good, good. I like that we've named them. <laughs> Everyday Margo's got her great. Oh, Velma. Velma, wow. I like the sickle claw we see on the bottom there. And you put it in the right spot, which is good, because you know sometimes people don't know where the claw is supposed to go, so it's supposed to go on the foot. A lot of people here have a few could be paleo artists, uh, right? Is. Future and paleo art, right here for sure. How about Rivers and Zella? Yeah. This one's pretty great. Ross the Velopter. I see that was a Friends reference. That's funny. Oh, that's cute. Oh yeah, the Friends reference. We're here for that. All right, I think we got a couple more. We got Natty right here. Natty looking good per usual. Nice. We got Ashley. Oh, look at that. We got a person for scale. I like this size scale. You did that real well. Real right. well. All right, let's see if we can find a couple. Do we have any more? I guess I see one more here from Julian. <laughs> I have a couple of questions coming up, Sheena. Um, as far as fossil finds, how many have been found around what was the Inland Sea? And then have uh, how often do do does field work happen in antarctica for paleontology oh. this will be our last question shana take it away okay when you say, i think inland sea does that mean I, this, this might be referring to the cretaceous like interior seaway in the u.s it's yeah nice. i mean that's where a lot of fossils are found a lot of dinosaur fossils and fossils in general from that time period are found in the u.s because having some sort of water environment like helps preserve um fossils you know and that means that there was probably a lot of animals there so it increases the chances that you're going to find it it's rare that you're going to find like in an ocean environment that you're going to find a dinosaur but sometimes it happens and when it does it can be amazing like the um ankylosaur that was found in canada that's the 3d preserved one that's like one of the best fossils ever found just happened to float out to sea. So you're like really lucky when that happens um, in Antarctica. So the National Science Foundation supports a lot of research in Antarctica and paleontological research. Um, they went out, uh, I think it was two years ago was the last time that they went out on a dinosaur. They look for dinosaurs and marine reptiles generally when they go out there. Um, I think they're looking for, the group's looking for funding again to see if they can get back out. It takes so long for them to prepare to go on these trips because it's a huge effort. Um, there are a lot of them are helicopter camps and they have to build out the whole camp and then stay there for a couple months and then come home. It's a, 
unbelievably huge effort. Um, there's an exit, well, you can't, I guess it's probably, you could probably look, read about it online at this point, but at LA County, they had the Antarctic dinosaurs exhibit. I'm not sure where that exhibit is now, um, where it traveled to, because I know it was Field Museum made it, and then it was in LA County with the help of NSF. So if you're interested, there is a cool exhibit on it that's very new, that's very up to date. So I have to find out where it is right now though. But yeah, there are dinosaurs in Antarctica, which always surprises people. Cool. Yeah, we found dinosaurs on every single continent, which is pretty bonkers. It is, it's good to remember that the continents weren't in the same position they are now. Back then, Antarctica was a little bit warmer, farther north, closer to the equator. Uh, yeah, we found them every single continent, which is pretty awesome. So we are just about out of time today. If you guys have any other questions at all, you can hit up Shana. Uh, all the information is in the chat box. Um, Shana, thank you so much for joining this. This is amazing. It's great to have an actual dinosaur scientist to talk about field work rather than just us sitting comfortably in our homes. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm so glad I could talk to everyone about it. I wish I could be doing field work right now, um, but all my trips that I was gonna go on were canceled. So. Here we are. <laughs> um, now I usually just follow people around and write about what they're doing, which is actually pretty fun. So I don't have to do a lot of the work and I can just uh, hang out, so. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, you guys. If you wanna support this, uh, we're trying to get a bigger Zoomer, we're trying to get more people to come and nerd out with us every day. You can throw us a couple bones. <laughs> uh, I'm on Venmo at dustin Groick, uh, G-R-O-W-I-C-K, or PayPal, it's dgrowick at gmail.com is my email address. We appreciate all of that. We're trying to make this as big and fun as possible. Speaking of, we're going to switch gears a little bit tomorrow. Tomorrow is Saturday, um, and we're actually going to talk to the man, the city councilman in New York City who oversees all the cultural funding for the different museums and cultural institutions. We're also going to talk a little bit about where I live normally in Queens, which is literally the epicenter of coronavirus right now. City councilman, majority leader, Jimmy Van Bramer is going to join us. Oh, wow. I'm yeah. so excited. I'm very excited. He is such a cool guy, has such a cool story, has such a huge love for museums just like us. And I know his favorite dinosaur is T-Rex. He's probably going to drop some T-Rex facts tomorrow too. I'm so excited about that. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Shana, for joining us. And you guys, I don't care if you're scooping ice cream or simply chipping it away at Cretaceous era rock in Mongolia. Never stop digging. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Happy Friday. I love you all. Peace. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Shana. Bye. Bye.